Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's February 2024, and you're listening to episode 380, which is a discussion of the film Freud's Last Session. And just as a heads up, our discussion will contain a lot of spoilers for the film. Today's guest is Dr. Mary Beth Baguette, who is professor of English at Houston Christian University. She also has an interest in promoting humanities education. Her most recent book is co-edited, and it is called Ted Lasso and Philosophy. Mary Beth and her husband, David, have written a film review article for the Christian Research Journal, and their article is called Mare Simulation, a Review of Freud's Last session. And you can read their article for free on our website, equip.org. Mary Beth, it's so good to have you back on the podcast. Can you give us a little bit of background for this movie, Freud's Last Session, because it has had various incarnations in other formats? Freud's Last Session began as a popular psychology course. It was taught by Harvard professor and practicing psychiatrist Armand Nikolai, He taught the class for over 30 years. What he did was structured it around the opposing views of C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud on central questions of human existence, questions about the nature of reality, whether God exists, who and what we are as human beings, what it is that drives our decisions and desires, and a whole lot more. It's really a fascinating idea for a course. At first glance, the two figures might seem to have little in common, but... Nikolai realized something even more central. At the heart of the considerable output of each figure are concerns about the problem of pain and suffering, notions about love and sex, the fundamental purpose and significance of life and death. Big, weighty, truly existential issues. And Nikolai saw each thinker as offering substantive answers, having weighed the matters carefully and considered alternative positions in great detail. The conclusions that each man arrived at, and actually even more, their conclusions in conversation with each other, are worth the time and effort that we can give them, he thought, because ultimately, where we land on these topics colors how we see everything else, thus their relevance to Nikolai's field of psychiatry. As Nikolai himself explains in a 2004 interview in PBS, he really saw that a person's worldview how somebody answers basic questions about meaning, values, purpose, identity, motivations, our destiny. It influences not only who we are, but how we live our lives, he said. And he takes it to another level. He wanted the students not only to understand the worldview that they themselves embraced, but also to understand at least some form of the worldview that they reject. That course, having lasted every year in and out for 30 years, that really proves how, how long it went that, that he was right, that it really is good fodder for thinking through one's own world, worldview, one's own beliefs. It was out of that Harvard course that Nikolai wrote a book called The Question of God, C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud Debate God, Love, Sex, and the Meaning of Life. He has chapters about the creator, conscience, and happiness. But what he does is just let each thinker speak for themselves, where he kind of imagines this dialogue between them and and adjudicates that. The promotional material for the book indicates that Nikolai is not trying to sway readers one way or the other, even if he does hold his own convictions. Rather, what the book is, is an invitation to readers to think through these issues for themselves, using the substantial and significant work that Lewis and Freud had done as a starting point in their own process of discovery. It really is a great book, and we highly recommend it for anyone who wants to reckon with these important questions. 
to think through the answers on offer from the two significant thinkers. Of course, these thinkers continue to have an outsized influence on Western culture. The book in turn spawned a 2004 PBS miniseries of the same name. That series expands the investigation begun by Nikolai and complements it with imaginative reenactments, interviews, and discussion. It was almost inevitable that someone would see in all of this dramatic presentation the pre potential for something more, a fictional depiction of the two men in actual conversation. And that's what Mark St. Germain did. He wrote the play called Freud's Last Session, which premiered off-Broadway in 2010. There, St. Germain envisioned Lewis visiting Freud in 1939. Freud was living in London at the time to escape the Nazi annexation of Austria. It's remotely possible for the two to have met, and St. Germain runs with that possibility, using Nikolai's book as source material for the conversations that ensues. It's this play that filmmaker Matt Brown, along with St. Germain, they use that to adapt and make the, the film of the same name that came out last year, the one featuring Anthony Hopkins as Freud and Matthew Good as Lewis. Most people have heard the name Sigmund Freud, and he lived in the 18th and 19th centuries. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about who he was? Sigmund Freud is known today as the founder of psychoanalysis. He was born in the mid-19th century as an Austrian physician whose work with patients struggling with emotional and mental illness that led him to develop novel theories about the mind, psychical desires and drives, and human development. Most of what I personally know about Freud comes from my study of literary theory and, and criticism, which shows you just a little bit about how far-reaching his influence has been. The 19th century, recall, was an era marked by doubt and erosion of societal foundations, a growing loss of faith in the transcendent. Freud both imbibed that spirit and furthered it, with his theories of the unconscious pushing back against the elevation of reason in the earlier century. It was not human reason that guided us for Freud, but our underlying desires and subconscious defenses that often formed in, in childhood. Freud's work revolutionized the Western conception of man as rational creature with agency to live as he best saw fit. Instead, Freud envisioned human beings as at the mercy and more often than not, entirely unaware of what was really driving us and dictating our actions. The implications for adopting such a view are ground-shaking and far-reaching. In my own field of literary studies, for example, a Freudian perspective challenges the notion of objectivity, that we can either truly know or fully understand what we're reading or writing, even writing. Rather, how one interprets the things that are set before him or her are driven ultimately, according to Freud, by the unconscious psyche, processes that we might only partially be able to identify, things like condensation, transference, repetition, repression. We're never fully in charge of them, though. They're outside of our control and sometimes even, most often actually, our awareness. Freud's philosophy of the human psyche evolved over the course of his career, but every version that he put out insisted on an inaccessible force that was the real driver of our activities. He began with what was called a dynamic model, where the conscious and unconscious are at odds with one another. Then he shifted a little bit later to what he called an economic model, and that centered on the interaction between the pleasure principle and the reality principle. Another phase of his career focused on the typographical model, where the psyche has three parts, and you'll recognize these, which again shows the influence of Freud in our language, the id, the ego, the superego. They're just kind of taken for granted now, but that really originated with Freud. Later, he turned to stages of human development, and he described them as moving from oral to anal to phallic to oedipal, or Electra complex. What I understand, I'm outside of this field, but what I understand that these various models of the psyche have largely been discredited and left behind in the field of psychology. But even while that's happening, Freud's influence remains very strong culturally. 
His work was developed from a substantial body of case studies where he actually was interviewing patients, um, having talk sessions with them. For example, his landmark interpretation of dreams, where he first advanced his theory of the unconscious, is built on his direct work with patients, from which he attempted to establish a grammar for how dreams mean, how we, we should go about interpreting that meaning. Dreams are good fodder for getting a glimpse of what underlies the conscious mind for Freud, since one's defenses are depressed in sleep. They can't censor what pops up. This is also why jokes and slips of the tongue are good windows for Freud into the psyche. In interpreting dreams, Freud points to two levels, the latent content, what it is that lies behind dreams themselves, and is actually the real stuff of the dream, the real power, and then the manifest content. That's what we see, what we experience in dreams. Making sense of that connection, how the patient and psychoanalyst sees through the manifest content to the latent is reliant on things like free association and paying careful attention to the symbolism, the symbols and the symbolism that comes up. When one reads interpretation of dreams, it's really easy to see why Freud's ideas have seeped so fully into something like literary studies. Freud himself actually wrote about literature. He used stories and myths as examples, such as what he did with the Oedipal Complex. He also saw creative writing as a means to tap into a liminal space where the psyche could have free play outside the guard of the defenses. All of this really dovetails well with other theories, other critical theories that gained prominence over the course of the 20th century, things like Marxism and deconstruction. So Freud really is rightly recognized as a key figure in shifting the ground toward a postmodern turn. Even though the Christian Research Journal is now online completely free without a paywall, no subscription needed. And this is a place where you can access on our website, equip.org, more than 45 years of content. That's thousands and thousands of articles completely free to you. We would still ask that you would consider partnering with us. We have new content every single week, a brand new article. We do believe that our authors should be paid a remuneration for their research and work for us. And we continue to bring articles in classic apologetics, Christian living, cultural apologetics, ethics from a Christian perspective, and all kinds of different content to equip you in your faith and to be able to share your faith and grow closer to Christ. And so we ask that you would partner with us by giving us a tip. It could be something very simple like, $3, $5, $10, something that you could give us, maybe skip something in your entertainment budget for the week and give us a tip, which you can easily do at our website, equip.org. Go on there, click on journal and at any one of the landing pages for postmodern realities. If you click on that, you will find a link to give us a tip. In addition, we would always ask that you would consider taking some of your time, which is completely free to you. And just would you please give us a rating or review, particularly on Apple Podcasts, because as you know, the internet runs on algorithms and those algorithms favor things that people think are popular to suggest them to other people. So would you please tell people why you listen to this podcast or give us a starred review. So now back to my conversation with Mary Beth Baguette about the film Freud's Last Session. C.S. Lewis is a familiar name to a lot of Christian apologists, but some people might not know exactly who he was. So can you tell us a little bit more about C.S. Lewis? Many consider Clive Staples Lewis to be the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century. Lewis, known as Jack to his friends, was born in 1898 in Belfast, Ireland. He was one of two boys and he lost his mother when he was really young. He was about 10 years old when he lost her. His father really didn't handle the loss very well. He was emotionally distant and not very good at helping the boys through their own grief. What he did instead was pack them up, 
head them off to school in England. Lewis particularly had a bad experience. Eventually, though, he was able to be tutored by William Kirkpatrick, the so-called Great Knock. Kirkpatrick had actually tutored Lewis's father, too. The Great Knock was a hardened materialist but rigorously logical thinker, and Lewis always credited him for having been such a formidable influence. In his teenage years, Lewis lost the faith of his childhood. He was intellectually gifted. He read voraciously, even as a child. But he had a very creative and fertile mind, too. After fighting in World War I, he ended up attending Oxford and teaching there at Magdalen College, where he became a distinguished Oxford Don and taught medieval literature. Closer to the end of his career, he taught at Cambridge, again, interestingly enough, at Magdalen College. Early in his tenure at Oxford, because of the influence of J.R.R. Tolkien and other Christian friends, he converted first to theism and then to Christianity. For quite a while, he ran the Socratic Club at Oxford, a weekly discussion group involving believers and unbelievers alike. He was a prolific writer his whole life. He did serious literary scholarship, but he also did great work as a Christian thinker and apologist, and in fact was a literary author too. Among his most famous Christian works were nonfiction books like Mere Christianity, The Problem of Pain, and Miracles. Among his imaginative works were Pilgrim's Regress, Screwtape Letters, The Great Divorce, The Space Trilogy, The Chronicles of Narnia, Until We Have Faces. This list of his books, though, is far from exhaustive. The first part of Mere Christianity, which is often the most popular of his books, was originally delivered as BBC talks that he gave in London during World War II. These talks proved popular, which is sort of amazing. He was giving a moral argument for God in the midst of a war, and he found a large and captivated audience. Near the end of his life, he married Joy Davidman, who exerted an influence on his writing of Till We Have Faces, often Till We Have Faces is thought of as his best novel. As is well known, she contracted cancer and died young in her early 40s, before Lewis, and still she was 17 years his junior, but he still lived past her. Reflections on the anguish of this loss led him to write A Grief Observed. Originally, that book was published anonymously. After a long and productive career, Lewis died in 1963, on the same day that John F. Kennedy and Aldous Huxley died. But since his death, the popularity of his writings has only continued to spread. So thinking about this film, in real life, did Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis ever actually meet? As far as we know, Freud and Lewis never actually met in person, though it is at least possible. It's this possibility, however remote, that led to the fascinating prospect explored in the movie. What would such a conversation have been like? Freud would have been near the end of his life, after a long and productive career. Lewis would have been about 40, with over 20 very productive years still to go. I think when we think about a conversation between the two men, we tend to think about Lewis in full flower, having a substantive conversation with Freud, also at his peak. But the age difference would have made this difficult. Freud was 42 years Lewis's senior. Still, the notion of a conversation between them is intriguing. We can't help but wonder, how would the two figures navigate their significant worldview differences? What rich conversation might emerge? How would they present their arguments and respond to critiques? What kinds of questions would each raise for the other? And of course, which position would come out on top? The film was quick to remind us that it is indeed possible that these two giants in their respective fields met face to face. In the last year of his life, Freud lived in London after he fled Vienna in the wake of Hitler's annexation of Austria. And there's good evidence that he did indeed meet with an Oxford Don in his final weeks. That time period overlapped with Lewis's tenure at the university. It's pure speculation, of course, that this young academic caller was Lewis. But the notion's intriguing nonetheless, 
and ideal fodder for the filmmaker's fancy. In real life, Lewis interacted with Freud's work, which makes good sense in light of Freud's significant and widespread influence. Hearing them really have an engaging conversation would have been nothing less than riveting. Can you give our listeners a little bit of historical context about this film? Freud's last session is set during World War II, actually right when it was getting underway. As mentioned earlier, Freud was living in London, having fled Vienna in the wake of Hitler's annexation of Austria. London itself was under attack, necessitating Freud and Lewis's trip to a bomb shelter. September 1939 was just after Hitler invaded Poland and Britain declared war on Germany. This would have provided a particularly poignant context for their discussion. In the movie, the Freud character claims that moral certitude is the real menace. And we can all certainly think of examples where moral rhetoric has been used in unprincipled ways to advance hideous agendas. The Germans themselves did this, unfairly accusing the Poles of all manner of wickedness and characterizing them in inhuman terms. But this is just when, say, objective considerations of justice should be brought to bear to put a stop to such cruelty and inhumanity and dehumanization. As horrible as Hitler was, he's one of those go-to examples, even still today, as a poignant reminder of the depths of depravity we as human beings are capable of, of the treachery sanctioned when we deny humanity of others. It's supremely ironic that while the context of Freud's and Lewis's conversation was war against Hitler and the Nazis, the Freud character would so vociferously lament the menace of moral certainty. And what an opportunity that should have provided the fictional Lewis character to speak of the Tao, of axiomatic moral truths, of the basic entailments of justice or human dignity, value, and worth. In real life, it was during World War II that the first portion of mere Christianity made up Lewis's broadcast talks. And it's telling that his words, which focus heavily on what moral truths can reveal to us about ourselves and the world, found such a wide and receptive audience, even in the throes of war. Lewis was a man who took morality seriously, and it makes sense that his words resonated when England was up against a truly horrific enemy that had left any semblance of real morality behind. Is there a difference between the fictional C.S. Lewis as portrayed in this film and the real C.S. Lewis? There's a huge difference between the fictional Lewis and the real Lewis. First, the Lewis depicted in the movie was just 40. So the things that he was really known for, he actually wrote later, and they weren't even tapped into in the movie. In the book that the movie is based on by Nikolai, the discussion presented shows Lewis and Freud at their peak, and they're able to avail themselves of the full lifetime of work. In the movie, the deck is stacked a bit against Lewis. He's so much younger than Freud. So Freud really is the one. He was the driver. For the most part, Lewis's character is depicted as a quizzical student, learning from the older, wiser um, intellectual. Time and again, Freud seems to have the last word, and there's little doubt that the real-life Lewis would have conducted himself considerably better in the discussion. Over and over again, the Freud character rants and raves, and the Lewis character is shown stultified and silent. Perhaps our biggest disappointment in the film is that we expected so much more from the Lewis character. He has his moments of insight, but too often he responds to Freud's passion indictments with quizzical looks of befuddlement. Surely Lewis in real life would have fared much better. One of the more egregious examples of this comes when Freud pushes the problem of evil. So Lewis goes ahead and states it very plainly. And this is a quote from the film. I don't know, Lewis says, and I don't pretend to. It's the most difficult question of all, isn't it? If God is good, why would he would make his creatures perfectly happy? But we aren't. So God lacks goodness or power or both. 
It strains credulity to imagine the real Lewis giving up so easily. Even further than that, what he says there stands in patent contrast with what Lewis actually said on the matter. To be fair, the fictional Lewis does immediately add that suffering can conduce to spiritual and moral growth. He appeals there to a common theodicy. Freud pushes back, though. He umps the ante, ridiculing the notion by recalling a particularly difficult of a child's, his grandson's, in fact, his seemingly needless and painful death. This was a point where the conversation really could have gotten interesting. Maybe Lewis could have shared biblical teachings about cruciformity, talked about the sufferings that Jesus willingly endured for the redemption of the world, the power of God posthumously to redeem the worst of sufferings in this world. Instead, it's Freud's skepticism that's given the last word. Nothing is said there of the secularist's own problem of evil, not how to reconcile suffering with God, but why is suffering bad at all if the world is as they describe it, a world of swirling collocations of atoms? Freud cannot both be mad at God and disbelieve in God, at least not with much coherence. So were you happy with how this film portrayed the engagement of these two important thinkers? We really weren't happy with the engagement of the two thinkers in the film. We have an early scene that kind of tells you what's coming. Freud is describing his visitor as a Christian apologist, and then he adds, he has a lot to apologize for. And that's the kind of thing that we get throughout. Nothing like serious, substantive engagement. Rather, we get sound bites, low-hanging fruit, cheap shots, emotional outbursts. It's also kind of interesting that... They, they chose the casting the way that they did. It kind of tips the scales subtly. Recall that Hopkins famously portrayed Lewis in the 1993 movie Shadowlands. Those familiar with the film might be encouraged with this visual contrast to think the youthful Hopkins Lewis, now three decades older, has matured. His childish beliefs have been left long behind they're now displaced by the older, wiser Hopkins Freud. Interestingly enough, Lewis, the actual man, traveled the opposite trajectory. He was an atheist in young adulthood, and as he aged, he moved to theism and then to Christianity. He did so, it's important to note, through sustained relationships with believers and impassioned debates that dealt with substantive issues. What we get instead from Freud's last session is an isolated conversation between two relative strangers. It's not really the most promising context for deep mutual engagement. And the movie itself bears this out. While the real-life Lewis had interacted some with Freud's ideas, the fictional Freud seems only mildly aware of Lewis's work. Thrust into the encounter with very little common ground to build on, the conversation meanders. Rather than featuring real consideration of each other's fully fleshed out positions, the conversation often consists of two men swapping straw men, one-dimensional parodies of their ideas set down side by side. It's a little like a linguistic game, something like verbal tic-tac-toe. This simplistic plot device underscores that mere juxtaposition does not real contestation of ideas make. That would require tackling divergent perspectives head-on, assessing their relative merits, weighing their implications. There are lots of scenes in the film that hold promise for such examination, but sadly they slip away all too quickly. For example, as the two discuss their contrasting views of faith, the filmmakers truncate and abbreviate the encounter. Indebted to Ludwig er Feuerbach, Freud argues that religion is the product of the human desire to have wishes fulfilled. On such a view, we project what we long to be the case, which would make little sense of the harder doctrines of Christianity that Lewis took seriously, things like hell or prohibitive sexual limits. In contrast to the notion that religion is merely illusion, Lewis turned such Freudian conceptions on their head, using his argument from desire 
That's mentioned so briefly in the film. But it has an altogether different understanding of the relation between reality and our deepest desires, seeing them as subtle markers of truth. What the filmmakers depict as conclusion is really only the starting point for mining the richness of such ideas. Ultimately, the film is arguably most helpful as a window into our current moment, which decidedly favors Freud's perspective. Ours is more of a psychological age than a philosophical one, more Freudian than Lewisian, more effective than cognitive. Not surprisingly, Freud's method is allowed to structure much of the conversation of the film. Over and over again, psychologism trumps. We have Freud pontificating and conjecturing about the way Lewis and other religious believers need to grow up, how Lewis needs a divine father figure to compensate for a deficient earthly father, how Lewis is terrified of the abyss of death, how Lewis has yet to get over the fears fighting in World War I had instilled within him, and the like. In a retort that seems uncharacteristic for Lewis, even he joins in with some psychologism of his own. Perhaps, Lewis suggests, it is Freud's own fears about God's possibility that dissuades his belief, a conjecture that seems to delight Freud, who accords Lewis accolades for the maneuver. But right here is one of the film's most significant problems. Such psychological conjectures and predictable tit-for-tat, perhaps a little fun to play with, they do next to nothing to advance the discussion. Not to mention that Lewis's modus operandi in real life bore little resemblance to such empty speculation. If the conversation, such as it is, is driven by guesswork about the underlying motivations of one's interlocutor, substantive questions of truth and evidence go undiscussed. The problem actually might go even deeper than that, manifesting a dynamic rampant in contemporary conversations. Namely, there is often assumed a radical perspectivalism in dialogues of various sorts. We see it in the political arena all the time. Ideological adversaries take, talking past each other, each attributing the perspective of the other to their political party or rabid partisanship. Each also presumes to know the motives of the challenger, not in a genuine effort to understand or appreciate their perspective better, but to discredit and write off their views all the quicker. This practice is unfortunately what we find too often in this movie. The result is less a vital interplay of ideas than two people with incommensurable worldviews, each content to criticize the other. Better would have been a genuine quest to find some middle ground. Central questions with which both men grappled, divergent perspectives on particular phenomena like guilt or shame, and more of an effort to identify some of the evidential considerations that led each man to his own beliefs. Precious little of this hard work was done, to our chagrin and the detriment of the film. To the filmmaker's credit, there are hints of such a possibility, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in the, the conversation to continue. Indeed, in a movie that largely vitiates the power of the earlier scene, Freud later reminds Lewis of his terror in the shelter, suggesting that it showed how little real faith in God he has. Although we know of no such panic attacks that Lewis experienced, if he did suffer from them because of the trauma of war, this would hardly show a lack of faith in God. Rather, they would be emotional wounds from which he still needed healing and deliverance. Only the most simplistic understanding of authentic religious faith thinks it's an instant panacea for every instance of mental anguish or psychological impediment. At its best, Brown's film hints at the fruit that can result from seeing and celebrating our shared humanity and sensing the sacred in another but sadly it falls short of showcasing such possibilities in any compelling way. The filmmakers had a real opportunity here to enrich the cultural discussion surrounding Freud and Lewis, and more importantly, the crucial questions at the heart of their work. They really had so much to say about the nature of the world, humanity, and so much to offer by way of real intellectual engagement. Nikolai's book offers this, and we highly recommend it. But the film itself, instead of trying to capture that stimulating thought, that stimulation, it settles instead for simulation. So what can Christian apologists learn from watching this movie? Christian apologists aim to provide a rational defense of the faith, 
offering reasons for the hope we have within. Lewis was arguably the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century. So it's a great question to explore. What can apologists learn from watching the movie? We might suggest at least three takeaways. First, listen and be humble. We have a great message to share and we have some real insights into the nature of reality. As apologists, we need to cultivate real epistemic humility and attentive listening skills. We don't have to do all the talking. We need to become good listeners. We have something to offer and something to teach, but so do our interlocutors. We should ask lots of questions and listen to their answers. We should listen to their questions and discern the questions behind the questions. We don't have to have all the answers and we shouldn't presume to, we do or try to project that impression. We should just be true to our convictions and offer what evidence and arguments we can when the time is right. But usually we shouldn't expect instant results. Sometimes, as Greg Kuko puts it, we need to be content with putting proverbial pebbles in people's shoes. Ask them challenging questions to get them thinking. Help them see the steep price they may pay if they want to stick to their worldview. Come alongside them and help them understand that we're on their side. We don't just want to win a debate. We're inviting them into a mutually respective dialogue and let criticisms or personal attacks roll off our back. It's a small price to pay for the privilege of sharing the good news. Look for those moments of shared humanity and build on those. Take an interest in them personally and not just as subjects in an apologetic inter enterprise. One of the neat features of the movie was seeing the two men talking face to face, which was a helpful reminder that people are more than the sum of their ideas. They have histories, they exist in specific cultural and relational contexts, and are shaped by a range of factors extending beyond the intellectual. Don't be afraid to get to know others in all their complexity. One of the real limitations of the movie's depiction encountered was a, that the whole exchange was a single conversation over the course of a long afternoon. Near the end of the movie, the Freud character acknowledges the limitations they're functioning under, which should have lowered the expectations of what they could accomplish in such short compass. It would have been a great start, of course, but there were no follow-ups. And sometimes this is how it goes. We don't have a chance to form a long and lasting committed relationship with every interlocutor about life's mysteries. Sometimes it's just one encounter and perhaps even shorter than the one in the movie. In those cases, we can still do good, perhaps leave them, as mentioned earlier, with one or two really good questions to ponder, help them catch a new insight, see a problem with their view, or the need to be clearer on a matter or two. That said, when we are able to do evangelism and apologetics in the context of a real friendship, there is a great advantage to that. We can embody the gospel in all our dealings with those persons over a great period of time. We can teach by our actions as well as our words. We can show our commitment to them as people, that our care and concern for them is not contingent on their coming to agree with us. We can demonstrate patience as we explore their questions together and as they take time to come to their own conclusions. Whether we are ever able to see the harvest, we can and should continue to plant seeds, model love, exude the aroma of Christ, always seasoning our speech with grace and kindness and salt. Thirdly, what we can do better than the movie is move beyond the stock answers and superficiality so rampant in the world today. Mic drops and gotcha moments and too often an acrimonious spirit pervades our culture and is sadly often seeped into the apologetic community. Apologists should, at least most of the time, aim to be ironic and winsome, stirring in another a desire to know what is within us that makes us that way. Ours is a culture so often content with simple and shallow analysis. In this way, we as Christians should be profoundly countercultural. We should help people see the sacred in the everyday, the unspeakable dignity and value of persons, the joy in the little things of life, the profundity all around us, However you cut it, it's a remarkable thing that we're here as human beings. In a day rife with pessimism and cynicism, ours is a gloriously good message that there's a deep meaning to it all, 
a God who loves us enough to send his son for our salvation, that life is a comedy and not a tragedy. I'd like to know what you think was the best part of this film, Freud's Last Session, and what you thought was the worst part of this film. I'll start with the worst aspect of the film. There were, in fact, many contenders for this category, as we discussed in our review. But I think that the film's lack of real structure might be emblematic of everything else that's wrong with the film. As we noted, we love the premise. What tremendous possibility there is in putting Freud and Lewis in actual conversation. When we first saw the trailer, we couldn't wait to see the film. That Anthony Hopkins was now playing Freud, having earlier played Lewis, made the prospect all the more tantalizing. These two figures have so much to say to one another, as Armand Nicolai's book that provided the film's premise shows. But as we watched the film, we had the sense that the filmmakers rested content with the idea and didn't really do much with it. They just had very little else. Our review briefly mentions that the Freud character wanders around the house throughout the film. It's really unclear why he's doing so, but he moves from his office to the front room, to the garden, and back again repeatedly. And there seems to be no purpose other than providing a new backdrop for the confused and bemused look on the Lewis character's face. The wandering from room to room matched the conversations wandering from point to point. There was really no structure to speak of imposed on the film. Nothing that seemed to be behind the choice of topics discussed other than stream of consciousness, links being made from memory to incident just mentioned. I suppose that matches the title of the play. It was as though Lewis was on the couch and Freud was trying to draw out the phantoms in his psyche that are apparently driving him to a firm belief in God or insist on an objective moral reality. This is at odds with Nikolai's book, which is organized meticulously for easy comparison and contrast between the two thinkers. That said, the best element of the film are its moments that highlight the humanity of each man and have them caring for the humanity of the other. There are several of these moments that punctuate the story, Freud's concern for his daughter Anna, flashbacks to his childhood, scenes of Lewis at war and in recovery, even Freud and Lewis doting on Freud's dog. Apart from those, though, two scenes in particular stand out. First, when the air raid siren sounds, Freud and Lewis must escape to a bomb shelter. Being of advanced age, Freud lags behind and tells Lewis to go on without him. But Lewis will have none of it. He waits for and helps Freud, putting himself in danger even. Then Freud returns the favor. In the shelter itself, Lewis has flashbacks to the war, with a suggestion that he's suffering from PTSD. Freud sees what's happening and talks him out of the anxiety that's overwhelmed him. These deeply touching scenes are complemented by a later one, where Freud who is suffering from oral cancer and wears a painful prosthetic, accept Lewis's help to adjust it, despite how embarrassing it must be and how vulnerable it makes him. Although these human moments do not dominate the film, their presence is a good reminder that whatever their ideas were, the two men were much more than those, and they still needed love, support, and care, and had love to offer. While they weren't played up in the film, these connections can be a nice starting point for building common ground, despite deep worldview divides. And finally, I have a fun rapid fire question for Mary Beth. So National Tortilla Chip Day is coming up. That's on February 24th. And I'd like to ask you, what is your favorite way to eat tortilla chips? Do you like them best with salsa, queso, or nachos? Of those choices, I think I'm going to have to go with queso. You've been listening to episode 380 of the Postmodern Realities podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Dr. Mary Beth Baguette. 
She and her husband, David, have written a film review article for the Christian Research Journal, and their article is called Mare Simulation, a Review of Freud's Last Session. And you can read their article without a paywall for free at our website, equip.org. That's E-Q-U-I-P dot O-R-G. You won't want to miss out on subscribing to the other podcasts from the Christian Research Institute. We have the Bible Answer Man podcast, which is published Monday through Friday with the best of the week on Saturday. It's hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. In addition, Hank has a podcast called Hank Unplugged. Hank takes you out of the studio and into his study to engage in free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. And you won't want to miss out on the brand new podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Christian Research Journal Reads presents audio versions of Christian Research Journal articles It was a print incarnation of almost 45 years. It's now on the web, as you know, with new articles every single week. So you won't want to miss these audio articles of some of our most popular and most accessed articles on our website, equip.org.